We next want to ask, does society even need an ethical theory? So we'll start with an economic notion called overlapping generations, which is a, perhaps a somewhat imprecise uh, term. But the notion of this notion of the link between different generations goes like this. You have person A and they have a descendant, a child, person B, they have a child, person C, they have a child, person D, they have a child, person E, and then this goes on forever. Now let's suppose that person A cares about person B, person B cares about person C, person C cares about person D, and person D cares about person E. One reason why they, why this might be true, while they might uh, care about each other is that they overlap in time. So A and B have some overlap in time even though B is younger than A and so A therefore knows person B's utility and cares about person B's utility. I, I suppose in theory you might be able to generate this model even if A and B didn't overlap in time but you would you would need A to have foreknowledge of B's utility, and so it's easiest to think about the generations as being overlapping. The point is that uh, because B cares about C and A cares about B, A is going to indirectly care about C. And similarly, A is going to indirectly care about E because D cares about E and C cares about D and B cares about C and A cares about B. So this is a notion that you don't really have to worry much explicitly about whether people are going to take care of future generations because they will. Uh, even if they only care about just one generation from now, they're still going to take care of people who live in future generations because of, of uh, this uh, A cares about B, who cares about C, who cares about D, who cares about E. Um, so this is a notion that intergenerational equity in some sense is going to be taken care of just by individual actions and so it's not clear that you need a government to interfere in this. This is related to an idea which is mostly used in macroeconomics, so I'm not an expert in it, called Ricardian equivalence. Now Ricardian equivalence is named after David, the same David Ricardo that we talked about before, but I don't actually know why it's named after him. Uh, the idea here goes roughly along the following lines, and I'm not a macroeconomist, so this uh, is not exactly the way a macroeconomist would probably discuss this, but it's an argument that, let's say, uh, government goes into deficit spending when A is alive in order to save the economy from a depression. And one might think that A is really happy that the government is spending a lot of money. But the people who believe in Ricardian equivalence say, no, actually, A isn't happy when the government is spending a lot of money on, on person A in, in A's time. Because A knows that in order to spend this money, the government has gone into debt. It's going to have to pay that debt back. Maybe it's Generation D or Generation E or Person D, Person E, who's going to have to pay the money back. And so D or E is going to be worse off than they would have been otherwise because they have this debt they have to pay back. Then since A cares about D and E indirectly if not directly, then when A sees the government go into debt in order to spend a lot of money on A, uh, it benefits A on the one hand, but on the other hand it hurts A because it hurts D and E, and so these things cancel out, and so actually the increased government spending when A is alive doesn't actually help A at all. So this is a notion that argues that governments can't actually spend money in order to fight recessions and depressions because uh, the money's going to have to be paid back for future generations and we care too much about future generations and so uh, we get unhappy when the government spends money um, because we think about the burden that it places on future generations and so the extra money that gets spent doesn't do anything in the present time. Now there are certainly objections that can be made to that argument. For one thing, if it's a government like the United States which prints its own money, then the government doesn't have to 
ask persons D or E to pay it back, the government can simply print the money that's required to pay back the borrowing, print it out of thin air, and so uh, so actually it's it's not clear that anybody has to pay the money back. So that's just one of many objections one can make to this argument. Another objection though is more interesting for us and that is that the whole construction here of generations is not correct because it doesn't take into account sexual reproduction. So this is Herman Daly's point, and we, we've talked about Daly before. Daly's point is that humans reproduce sexually, and so a correct family tree would look something like this. Person A1 marries person A2, person A3 marries person A4, A1 and A2 have a child called B1, A3 and A4 have a child called B2, B1 and B2 get married, they have a child called C1. Now let's suppose that A1, A2, A3, and A4 care about C1. Either they care about C1 directly, that is their grandchild, they care about C1 directly, or maybe they care about C1 only indirectly. In other words, maybe A1 and A2 only care about B1, and A3 and A4 only care about B2, but B1 cares about C1 and B2 cares about C1, and so the A's indirectly care about C1. Now suppose that A4 gives a gift to C1. So it transfers money to C1. That increases the utility of C1. Clearly, it also increases the utility of A4, because otherwise A4 would, wouldn't have given the gift. Think about the influence on A1, A2, and A3. They care about C1. A4's transfer of money to C1 increases the utility of A1, A2, and A3, and A3 as well as A4. In other words, A1 finds out that his grandchild C1 is better off, that means A1's utility goes up. This is an ex a positive external effect of A4's gift to C1. A4's gift to C1 generates a positive externality on A1, A2, and A3. Now maybe A3 being married to A4 Perhaps A3 and A4 are, are one unit, and so it's an internal effect, not an external effect. But certainly, as regards A, A1 and A2, the gift from A4 to C1 is a positive externality on A1 and A2. Now, you know from when we first started talking about externalities that just like in perfect competition, a negative externality occurs too much, and you need government intervention in order to reduce that activity. Similarly, a positive externality with a laissez-faire policy occurs too little. And you would want government to interfere in order to increase the giving of the A generation to C. A government intervention that forces the A's to give a little bit more to C would actually not only increase C's utility, which is obvious, but it would increase A's utility as well, all of the A's utility. So this positive externality means that the competitive equilibrium is not socially optimal. And therefore, I think this more fundamentally challenges this kind of idea, the Ricardian equivalence idea of the way that different gen generations of humans are linked to each other. Uh, clearly, this is biologically the right sort of diagram, and it shows an externality that's absent in the Ricardian equivalence externality. Okay, so that's the uh, that's these points here. The next uh, topic is this one here, Guyanism, and for that I want to switch to a different screen. Guyanism is a little hard to define, so I pulled up here this Wikipedia entry about Gaia, which is the name behind Guyanism. So Gaia in ancient Greek mythology was one of the the first generation of Greek gods. So there were at least two generations of Greek gods. The second generation we think of as being the Olympian gods, which is mentioned here on the uh, next to last 
line of this paragraph. And uh, Gaia, who, as the second line says here, is a personification of the Earth in Greek mythology, was one of the first generation of Greek gods. And now, in the italicized very first sentence of this entry, it says, this article is about the primordial Greek goddess. For the theory of Earth as an organism, see Gaia hypothesis. So let me click on that, the Gaia hypothesis. And let me read the first sentence here. The Gaia hypothesis, also known as the Gaia theory or the Gaia principle, proposes that living organisms interact with their inorganic surroundings on Earth to form a synergistic and self-regulating complex system that helps to maintain and perpetuate the conditions for life on the planet. Now, the term complex system here means it's a system that can't be characterized by simple linear differential equations, but it's a lot more complicated than that. The next paragraph says that the hypothesis was formulated by chemist James Lovelock in the 1970s. Then Lovelock named the idea after Gaia, the primordial goddess who personified Earth in Greek mythology. Uh, and the last paragraph here says the Gaia hypothesis was initially criticized for being te teleological, that is, well, and against the principles of natural selection. That means that it supposes that nature or evolution actually has a goal, that it's directed. And the last sentence says, even so, the Gaia hypothesis continues to attract criticism, and today some scientists consider it to be only weakly supported by or at odds with the available evidence. So there's a scientific Gaia hypothesis, which we're, I'm not really going to talk about much, but this gave rise to the idea of Gaia as a sort of mystical, quasi-religious notion of, maybe we'll say, Mother Earth, um, and the notion that humans owe something to the Earth, that we have ethical slash moral obligations to the Earth. So this is not a scientific idea, this is a, an ethical idea, or maybe a religious idea, and that's what the book is referring to by Gaianism. S okay, so that's uh, that's the definition of, of Gaianism. And the point is that Gaianism is another ethical idea w which came about in the 1970s, but it certainly still, still has adherence today. Uh, people who think that we have ethical obligations to, let me say, Mother Nature, to Gaia, uh, that go, that, that are separate from any kind of eth ethical obligations we have to other people. Okay, I think I'll stop here. The next point is going to be opening up the moral reference class.